The stories in our second half here are very appropriate to our setting because they both take place in the past. And uh, we've got uh, one that's the more recent past, but this one actually, I found out, takes place in much the same time frame that they decorated this house. This house was donated um, from the family, and they donated it with all of the furniture and family possessions intact. But then when they restored it, they tried to restore it. Uh, it was a period from like 1914 to 1920-something, so it was an Art Nouveau sort of period. And appropriate enough, the next story takes place in 1923. So we're actually historically accurate. This story is by Carol McAdoo Rainey, who is a prolific writer and editor. Particularly, she works with the Chicken Soup for the Soul series. And you'll see that this story kind of fits in with that. And it, I enjoy it because it feels like something It fits with this house. And it's entitled, Into the Wind, A High Plains Holiday. She wasn't born on the high plains of Wyoming. Even now, she longed for the wooded lanes of the Dutch Pennsylvania farm she still called home. She was only here because in 1923, that's what wives did. They followed their husbands. And her husband had a powerful yen to homestead in the West. So here she found herself spending the holidays on the lonely, dust-blown plateaus of Wyoming. For the most part, Greta Klein had made friends with the land. Well, maybe not friends, but she was learning its ways. And that was the first key to survival in this harsh country. She'd even learned to accept her new house, a far cry from their gaily painted clabbered back east, the drafty tar paper shack rattled with each gust of December wind. The wind, the ever-blowing, good-for-nothing Wyoming wind. It was a thief that had puffed away the few autumn leaves before she even had a chance to savor them. It, it robbed the children of pleasant play. It stole away both the moisture from the crops and your very breath. Greta sighed and stoked the fire in the black majestic cook stove. A crooked smile sneaked onto her lips as she recalled her mother saying, if you want to get rich, my daughter, you must strike those matches twice. <laughs> rich? Hardly. Even her mother would be amazed and impressed at the ways Greta found to economize. Corn cobs burned for fuel, flour sacks sewn into underwear, Cardboard insoles layered to cover holes and extend the life of the children's shoes. And now Christmas was nearly here. Not that the landscape was any evidence. In the pre-dawn light, Greta pushed aside the gunny sack, curtaining the window, and gazed out. No soft December snow blanketed the bare dirt. Instead, grim skies of gunmetal gray hovered while the bitter wind howled in swirls of dust. Its icy fingers clawed at the flimsy door. Its frigid breath seeped around the crooked window frames. And all the while, a lone cottonwood tree, their only summer shade, batted its skeletal arms in a field dotted with tumbleweeds too stubborn to blow away. Shivering Greta turned back to the warmth of the kitchen. Christmas. And we can't even spare a tree for the children. Her children were so young, she knew they carried few memories of holidays back home, of stately evergreens brushing the ceiling, of Grossmutter's fine hand-blown glass icicles dripping from the full branches, of the glow from dozens of small white candles clipped to the needles, of visits from the Weihnachtsman, Father Christmas, or of a table groaning under the weight of tasty traditional delicacies, roast goose with potato dumplings, sauerkraut and noodles, apple strudel. Oh, and don't forget all the home-baked desserts with their old world names. I must remember to teach them to the children. Names like Pfeffernus, Leibkuchen, Blitzkuchen, Nusstort, Apfelfahnkuchen, and Schnitzbrot. Like taking roll call, Greta whispered her favorites one by one. The familiar German words rolled from her tongue, 
comforting her with their rhythm and taste. Hmm, schnitzbrot, fruit bread. Maybe if I made some substitutions, altered the proportions, I wonder, with an excitement she hadn't felt in a long time, Greta pulled out a saucepan, a wooden spoon, and a large tin bowl. She reached for the carefully hoarded currants and dried peaches. Since the fruit was sweet, maybe the children wouldn't notice that she'd have to skimp on sugar. She could spare two eggs and felt lucky to have fresh milk from the cow. But Schnitzbrot needed yeast. Greta hesitated. Do I dare? She dared. Greta lifted the crock of sourdough starter, her old standby. She had tended it faithfully for months, stirring for four days, adding exact amounts of milk, flour, and sugar each fifth day. It was the foundation for their regular fare of bread, johnny cakes, and biscuits. Why not schnitzbrot? Greta grinned. Sour fruit bread. She could almost hear her mother say, Yeah, that's right, mein Greta. Lean into the wind and you will alive mit ease. Humming Stila Nacht under her breath, Greta set about stewing and draining and chopping the fruit. She measured, she mixed, she kneaded until the dough was soft and firm. Greta impulsively divided the dough into balls and rolled them like clay between her palms. She braided the strips and shaped them into small circles. Instead of the customary loaves, there would be a festive fruit bread wreath for each child. Covering the dough rings with dish towels, Greta set them aside to rise near the radiating warmth of the cook stove. Now, if only the children could have a tree, it would seem more like home. Then I think I could be satisfied. A Christmas tree. No amount of wishing, no amount of dreaming, no amount of wanting would make it so. Of course, there was still prayer. Doubtfully, Greta closed her eyes and paused for a lengthy, silent moment. Although it was nearly time to wake the family, she decided to let them sleep. At least she could give them that gift. Grabbing her long woolen coat, she headed for the door. She would see to a few outside chores first. Head lowered to shield her face from the grit of whirling dust, Greta leaned into the breath-stealing wind, aimed for the barn, and gasped when she felt it. Spiny tentacles as sharp as needles pricked her stockings and scratched her legs. Tumbleweeds. Thorny tumbleweeds. The last of those tenacious thistles had finally broken loose in this gale and rolled right to her feet. With a hoot of laughter, Greta plucked them from around her ankles. She gathered five, six, seven, and carried them gingerly to the house. Already, she could imagine the children giggling as they piled and stacked them to make a tree. A tumbleweed tree. A gift from the fickle wind. An answer to prayer. Wyoming style. Who would have thought? <laughs> Remembering Grossmutter's heirloom crystal icicles, she felt a fleeting pang of regret. But shrugging, she turned her thoughts toward carefully hoarded tissue paper, salvaged remnants of shiny ribbon, and scraps of cotton batting. The children could string popcorn and make paper chains. Together, they'd create new traditions. Perhaps with a few clicks of her knitting needles and a little more thought, she could even arrange for some small gifts from Father Christmas. And at that very moment, Greta swore she could hear her mother whisper, you think, my daughter, first you create sour schnitzbrot, and now a Wyoming Christmas tree. But the wonderful place is home. <laughs>